So um, when you come in, the first thing to look at is down at the bottom here. So you see the green light here. Okay, if that's solid green, that means the system is connected, the server is connected to the instrument, and you have access to it. If this is white, that means there's a program called the measurement server, I mentioned it this morning, isn't running. So basically there's an icon for it up here, it says measurement server. All you would have to do is start the measurement server. It would automatically connect and you would see this go from white to green, okay? If you come in here and see this is red, go and get him, okay? Because that's an error code, something's, something's not right, okay? Um, the top, what I call racing stripes, are the indication that the high voltage is on and that you have x-rays being generated. So when these are yellow, illuminate, that means that there's x-rays ge being generated. Uh, also, you see the little x-ray symbol here, yellow, that means that x-rays are on, powered up. If you see that flashing, that means that it's trying to stabilize. So when it does the calibration, which you'll probably do see if, it, if you're here while it's doing it, is you'll see that flashing while it's going through the calibration and stabilization process. So the calibration is just uh, uh, focusing the electron beam so it accurately hits the stream while you're generating x-ray. So it does that every 48 hours. I mentioned that this morning. So uh, what it does is a quick just alignment of that beam automatically. You don't do anything. Uh, but it'll take about two to four minutes, I think, for it to calibrate and then, uh, and then stabilize. Okay. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you look at. That's what you would want to see, green on the lower panel and uh, just the normal solid radiation symbol, yellow on the top, okay? Um, so this is your server computer. It has the software on there, so you need, that means that measurement server is running and, and is connected. The next program is BIS, and you'll just see it sitting down here at the bottom. There's an icon for it. It's Brooker Instrument Service in BIS. And you just need to have that running. And if it's not running, the program will come and complain about it. You try to connect between the server and the instrument, they'll come back and say BIS isn't running. Okay? If it's not running, all you have to do is, and there's an icon up here too, all you have to do is start it. But typically these programs will be kept running in the background. Okay? Um, there's two different kinds of what we call Proteum uh, versions. One is called Proteum Server, and the other one is just Proteum Suite. And the difference is Proteum Server is just meant for screening, simple screening. So it, it allows you to align the crystal and take a shot. It doesn't connect to the database and doesn't do anything else. So if you just want to put a crystal on to see if it, it diffracts, but you don't want to get into the database and make an entry, you can use Proteum Server, and that will allow you to center, take a shot, and be done with it. So you just got a new crystal form from a target. You don't know. You just want to see if it diffracts. You're not planning on collecting data. You bring it in. Just use Proteum Server, and you can center it and just take a quick shot. Okay. Um, so otherwise, you would always use Proteum because that has all the other functionalities, the indexing, data collection, all that. So at the very top, you've got the two programs right here. So Proteum is just the one on the left. Proteum Server is the one on the right. They're the same programs. It's just Proteum Server only has limited functionality and doesn't connect to the database. Takes a couple seconds for a uh, splash screen to show up. Okay, now this is what it would normally look like. And so when you have your accounts, you would have a user ID and password. Right now, we'll just use the default count, which is guest to guest, okay? okay now I'm logging into the database, but you don't see anything else because I haven't got into, um, haven't created an entry or opened an entry, okay? So to create one, I just go to the white here are going to sample new, and then that pops up this window. So it's got the path, right? It goes to C frames, that's the raw data frames, and then guest is the user that's logged in. So it's always frames is the data for, uh, directory, and then the subdirectory is a user folder, which would be you, right? Okay. 
if I type anything in here, it just mimics it down here. And if I say OK, it'll create a folder, if it's not already on the hard drive, with that name. Okay, and that's your path. And so then everything is directed toward that path. Okay? Or you can simply go into the open folder and then select any entry that's already been created. So I just created a test one. I say OK. And now all the, the apps are, are available. Okay? So the two things you have to do first are you have to log into the database and then you have to open or create a new entry in the database. Okay? All right. So, all right, so first of all, you've got all the menus I was talking about. Setup is the first one, and actually is a described sample where you can put in a one letter uh, code for your protein and our molecular weight. And if you do that, at the very end, it'll calculate the Matthews coefficient for you. So it'll give you the V sub M and uh, the solvent content based on the number of molecules in the asymmetric unit. So there's a little report function at the very bottom I didn't talk about today that actually s shows you everything you've done uh, as you've gone through the experiment. And then if you have the, the uh, sequence in here, it'll actually do the, the Matthews coefficient for you. Okay? And you can put other things in here. You can put the crystal dimensions. What I like to do is measure my crystal and then put in with the crystal dimensions with every sample that I run so that I have sort of a bookkeeping of you know, what the sample is like. I take a picture and I'll show you how to do that. Okay. The next uh, plugin that you would use is Center Crystal. And so every time I do something that requires the instrument, it will ask for a connection if I'm not connected already. So right now it's come back and says I need an instrument connection. All you need to do is say connect. It knows that this is the local host. It will go right to BIS and make a connection. The offline and online versions of the software are identical. There's no difference. The only difference is whether I'm connected to the instrument or not. Okay? And it automatically, in a second, you'll see the video image pop up. So that's the image from the microscope, video microscopes is in there. And the next few weeks, as you guys use this, we'll probably adjust the parameters of the lighting to help you see crystals better. And so, obviously, this is a giant rock, so there's no problem seeing it. But when you get this 50 micron crystal that's bathed in mother liquor in a loop, then it gets a little harder. And we can adjust the lighting to sort of optimize it so that it's easier for you guys to see your samples. So today, we'll just, we'll just deal with the, the giant crystal and, and, and then go from there. So what you see in here is you've got crosshairs. You've got all kinds of parameters, uh, things that up here. So up the very top are just. And usually, if you put the cursor over something, it'll tell you what the, what the icon is doing. Okay, so this is none. So that's just taking off all the uh, crosshairs. So the crosshairs tell you, hopefully, uh, where the center of rotation is. So the idea of centering is that you're trying to put the center of mass of the crystal at the center of rotation of the goriometer because, in theory, that's where the beam is. Okay, So that's all centering is. So you're just trying to put the uh, crystal so that as you rotate it, the center of mass of that crystal stays in the center of the x-ray beam. So what, we, what I've done is we've, we've created a couple pre-position. Pre I'll show you what, what they are. And then there's a couple automatic down, down here that you, you would use. So um, I've got mount and safe and, and uh, screen. And so you can change those to whatever you want, but I'll show you what positions they are. So if I hit mount up here, it's going to move the uh, system to a position where I would probably mount my first crystal. Okay. So it's straight up and down, and then we'll go in and, and pull things in and out. And I just wanted to show you what it looked like, and, and that's how I would use tongs. Do you guys, what do you guys use for sample handling? Do you use tongs? Do you use vials? Vials. Vials, okay. So you can use vials, you just have to, but you're going to have, it's not going to be inverted, so it's only going to be about 10 degrees above horizontal. So it's just a little trickier, but you can set up angles, and then Joel can work with you to have that position if you want to use it. Anybody who hasn't frozen before, I would suggest using tongs because inherently for this, they're, they're much easier. Okay? Um, but you can use either. 
and you'll get used to it. It's it's not that hard, right? So once you're used used to using vials, then it it it's just a position that you have to get for what you're comfortable with, and because you can move everything out of the way, you create a lot of room for yourself to get in and out. So, okay, so that's the mount position. I also have a position called safe that all it does is lift up the Kai, right? And so that just gets it from underneath the, the cold stream. So remember I was talking today, if you're gonna go away for a while, if you're freezing a bunch of samples or working with stuff, you kinda wanna move it out of the way, okay? And those two will easily go back and forth between the two. So who knows anything about a kappa going on, ometer? Yeah. You, oh, okay. Uh, so it's called a four circle goyometer because there's four circles that you rotate around. Okay? So let's go into here and I'll show you what, what that means. Okay, the first circle is two theta and it's the detector arm. And the detector will swing backwards or forwards, either way, to adjust the, the, uh, the brag angle that you're going to be uh, using for your data collection. So the higher the diffraction angle, the higher the resolution of the data that you're going to be acquiring. And you can do that by moving the detector one way or another. Okay? And you don't need to know what the two theta angle should be. We have a, a program here called Screen Crystal we'll talk about. But we automatically tell you what the resolution is at the edge of the detector. So if I put a, an angle of 10 in here, it will automatically update for me. So if I put in 10 right now, so it goes to 2.46. So in the beginning, when you're first using this, you won't have any clue what to do with this as far as where the angles go or anything. And let the program kind of guide you through that. After a while, you won't even need that. You'll know, okay, I want two angles from data. I move, need to move the detector out the tap. I mean, you will, you will get to learn what it does and where it moves to. Uh, what that means. Okay, so two theta, if I go to move that, plus 10 is towards me. Okay, minus 10 is back. Okay, and what that means is now I have 2.46 at the edge of the detector, and the beam stop shadow will not be in the middle, but the program automatically knows where the direct beam is, so that's no problem. Even if the, you don't see the beam stop shadow on the detector, it still knows where the direct beam is. Okay. So that's two theta. That swings the detector forwards and backwards and adjusts the diffraction angle that you're using in your experiment. Okay. Uh, the next one, pardon me? What is the closest you can point to? So you can get to about 40 millimeters. Which is, which is in resolution wise? Uh, at two theta zero, because you get any resolution, it just depends on what two theta angle is. Okay, at two, th oh, let's check. So 1.47 at 40 millimeters at 2 theta zero. So that's the side of the detector. Okay. So um, so and you can get there because if you put in any angle that isn't allowed, it will gray it out and not let you go there. Okay. So you can play around with this and be safely assured that you're not going to have any problems. Okay. Okay. So that's two theta. Then you have phi. So phi is the uh, goyometer head. So if you watch the goyometer head, so the phi axis just spins the goyometer head and the goyometer head only. That's one of the axes that you can do data collection around. And the phi axis, the position of the phi axis is based on kappa. And kappa, or chi, swings the whole kappa block. So you can see how phi moves as a function of where the kappa setting is. So now the phi axis is straight up and down before it was at a 35 degree angle. Okay, That's chi or kappa. They're the same angle, just different con uh, convention. And the last one is omega. And omega 
swings the whole cap a block. You see how the whole thing works? And so that's the other angle you can collect data around. So omega is fixed and perpendicular to the goiometer, and that's a, you can collect data around that. Phi is adjustable and just spins the goiometer head. So those are your four circles. It's two theta, chi or kappa, omega, and phi. There's actually a, what you could call a fifth circle in the way is the dx, right? So the dist crystal detector distance is, is, the third, is the fifth motion that you do with the system. Questions? Okay. All right, so say we're coming in to uh, Mount Cristo. We have one on, but we'll fake it. And what I would do is I would go back to the Santa Crystal plugin and I would hit mount. Now, the enclosure is interlocked and there's two releases, two buttons on either handle. When the instrument stops, then you can open it up. You can open it while it's moving, but it will stop. Nothing will move except for phi while you do it. When you close the doors, then it will resume and finish its its uh, movement. If you have data collection, you forget something in here, you don't actually have to stop it. If you open the enclosure, everything will stop. You pull it out, you close the enclosure, it should resume where it left off. Okay? So you just press both buttons and it just slides like that. Okay? When you close these, just don't slam them. <laughs> okay? So what I like to do is I like to just bring this one in and you can hear the click and then I just like that. So this should go solid green. If you see like a little door symbol on that, the doors aren't closed. And you'll hear this all of a sudden this clicking sound coming. And that means the interlocks aren't engaged. Okay? But that's all you have to do. So just be a little careful with it. And because there's no real guard in there and you can just slam the doors. So uh, just be a little careful when you slide it back. And that's what I typically do. I just, I sort of close one slowly. I just move it in from the side and then do the same thing for the other and you'll hear it click, okay? Now that's with the slide mode. There's another mode where if you push this tab in, and then it opens like this. So it, it would give you more room. So at some point, if you wanted to have a microscope in here and you were freezing inside the enclosure, you could do that, it gives you more room. So basically all it is is underneath here, there's a tab. So when you do this, you just push it in and then move it over a little bit and then to get the other, it just pops out like that, and they slide open. Okay. So go ahead and just try. So push in the two tabs, and then slowly just push it out. There you go. So when you bring it back, just bring it back slowly. There you go. Yep. And I usually do that, and then I come back the other side. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite there. There you go. So you see how the lights dim? So that means that the interlocks are engaged. So all the lights eventually will go off when you go to collect data, it automatically shuts the lights off. Okay, anybody else wanna try it? No takers, huh? Well, you, were, you have someone here to help you, so that, that I'm, I'll let it go. <laughs> but usually you wanna get in here and get a feel for what, what were you're doing around this, because the more comfortable you're with it, the, the more likely you are to use it. Right, so I would suggest even get some lights design and do some practice data sets if that works with how you have the arrangement. And just so you get a comfortable feeling with using this system so that when you have your own samples on here, you're not panicked about how do I use the instrument, okay? The other thing is these guys. So here's your collimator and your beam staff. They're magnetically mounted and they're on kinematic mounts so they self-locate it. So that means that when I put it back on, it automatically goes to the right location. Well, how you get them off is keep your hands, fingers away from the microscope lens. So what I do is I put both fingers on top and I brace the back and all you do is twist and it just comes off. This is pretty heavy, so you can put it down like that and it's pretty secure like that. So if you don't step on it or smack it, it'll stay aligned, it's pretty rigid. And so what we'll do, it's got a pretty strong magnet, so Joel will probably put something down here to, to make it a little easier to put on here. But I would just, when I take this off, I put it out of the way, I set it out so that 
I don't knock it over, okay? And so to put it back on, it's really easy. It just pops into place. So you go a little sideways and it just falls right in. I'll have, uh, you're, you're the brave one here, so I'll have you. Uh, so what I do is, and I'm right-handed and I do everything left because it's just the side that's easier for me. So I just take the back like this and all I do is just pull it towards me and it pops right off. Go ahead. And you just want to keep your fingers away from the microscope lens. That's it. So I'm just going to put it back. So that's it. Just let it fall. There you go. So you have a little guide. See how it wraps around the, the cold head nozzle? So that's a little guide of where the beam stop should be. Collimator's the same way. It just twists and comes off. So these guys, the white part goes towards the back. Okay, so this is a little harder because it can pop in a different, more than one location, but this is how I do it. So I put, put it so it's, I can feel the bottom of it. So to get it to fall in the right position, you just want to have this flush with the bottom of here. So I go up and it just pops right in. Okay, so when I take it off, I pull it towards me. I have it in my hand. I can feel the bottom. I just line up the two bottoms and it just pops in. If it's on wrong, you'll notice it because it'll be pointed somewhere else, right? So, and, the, and it won't collect data with it not in the right position. You want to try it? Yeah. So you have to push in a little bit here. It has to go in a little bit here, but I, so I usually come in from the bottom. So to take it off, you just grab the bottom, keep your hands again away from the lens, right? And then twist it towards you. There you go. So then I, I feel the bottom and I line up the bottoms first. So go up a little bit, there you go, and push in. There you go. That's it. What if I touch something else? Pardon me? What if I touch the microscope or anything else? What if I touch the microscope? Well, it, it just, you're just going to misalign it. You're not going to break anything, yeah, would you, yeah. but then you'd have to realign the microscope. So what I usually tell people is fingers below the collimator and fingers above the beam stop because the microscope lens is just right there. That's all, just once you've done this a few times, you won't even think about it. But if you do it right in the first time, you'll get, build that muscle memory and you'll, that way you'll, you'll do the same thing every time you do something. And that's all. So to change the divergence, all I do is pull this guy off and there's a set of collimators in here, right? So here's, there's the wide open one. I typically use the 0.3 by 17. That's a, a little bit of, uh, so there's a small pinhole on back and then the pinhole in front. So if I want to change the divergence, all I do is pull this one off and put that one on. And so th this is, so you can mark these, if you think about it, this will be, uh, this is strong, medium, weak, mm -hmm. but high, low, uh, or high, medium, and low divergence. And this is wide open, so it's full divergence, okay? So think about it in that way, and you got that. I'll give you that little chart I have, and it's it's going to base, be based on the size of your unit cell. If you've got 180 angstroms or less, that's your longest cell edge. Then you definitely want to go wide open if you can, because that's maximum intensity. But if you get above that, or if the mosaic spreads really high, then you might want to think about cutting down on the on the divergence. Okay. Um, okay. So those are the collimators, and that's, that's pretty straightforward. So that's all you really have to do. So the white part goes back, line up the bottoms, and just let it fall in, okay? And so you'll struggle with it for the first couple times, and then it, it's pretty, once you get used to where it has to go to put in, then it's just, you'll just pop it in and out, okay? Um, so that's it as far as the system goes. Now, um, if I were to mount a crystal, I'd take this off, I take this off, and now I've got a lot of room around there. So in your case of your vials, then I would swing kappa, I'd move the detector back farther, and I'd swing kappa up to about 10 degrees above, going back, and then I could come straight in from the front. So it's, 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 it's not as easy as inverted phi, but once you get used to it, it's pretty, pretty easy to do. Okay, questions? Pardon me? Would you take out the crystal and put it back to the um, So this is the only crystal I have. <laughs> I won't do that right now. Uh, but 
it's, I would just try that with system test crystals and take your tongs and do that. So all I do is, like I showed in that video, um, you just come up here with a pair of tongs and there you can do right or left handed because with everything out of the way there's a lot of room. And that's all I do. So with tongs, the only thing to worry about, if you get in a hurry, that's when you lose crystals. You have a lot of times with tongs. The, the temperature that stays below 125 Kelvin is about 20 seconds. So that's a long time. You don't realize it. So when you go up to it and you're going to take a crystal off and you get up and something's not quite right, just put it back in the liquid nitrogen. And then when you get it up, what I do is I keep it closed until I get to it and I open it, I, I put in one side first and I close it and then just twist it and it pops off. Okay, so I think if you get used to tongs, it's really easy to use. Uh, it's a little more work going back and forth inside the doer, but for me it's just, it's just easier because of the position of the coal head. Um, okay, so to move the goniometer other than phi, you have to have the doors closed. So if I do that and I go to safe, for instance, it lifts the goniometer out from underneath. And then I can do whatever, everything's fine as long as the goniometer isn't directly underneath the cold string. Okay. All right, so centering. So there, at the very bottom, there's a center button. And this takes me into a position that's perpendicular to the axis of the camera and brings in the detector as a backlight. So this is the one of the things we'll mess around with as far as the lighting and ever goes, goes and the gain and everything. It's a little dependent on the, uh, on the uh, ambient light and kind of what you're shooting at. So it's really hard to adjust this with a giant rock on there, but when you get some smaller crystals and some crowd protectant, you can start to play around with the lighting and get a better, better view for yourselves. Um, but so this is the, this is what the uh, um, crosshairs look like. I can take them off. So there's a couple things you can do up here. First of all, I can measure the, sh the uh, size of the crystal. So if I go to the little vector cursor and click that, I go and put the left mouse button, put it where I want it, left mouse button, that's the origin. I draw across here and it tells me the size of the vector. So that's 650 microns. So I do the same thing here. I put the left mouse click, set the origin, and that's 532 microns. So I could do that in each direction. I could spin it 90 and phi and then measure the third dimension. So I always measure my crystals this way. Uh, the other thing, and then to turn it off, you just hit the cross right here, and it turns off the vector. So there's, turn the vector on, and then it just says pixel, yeah? If you want to take a picture of it, you just click the little camera, and it will automatically write a PNG file out. So what I do is I take a picture of my crystal, I measure the dimensions, and then I have that for you know, my lab book or whatever I'm doing. Um, and then I usually create a, a different folder for it and it's just, you know, just and it'll keep that picture for you. So those are the couple things I do. Uh, you've got a zoom, so you've got a, 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 a um, digital zoom. The camera's fairly high resolution, so it'll actually give you a better view in most cases. One X brings you back, or the minus key, so plus key brings it in, minus key brings it back, and then one X actually just takes it back. You have a start and stop grab, which is just the camera. So if I click on stop grab, it stops the video feed. If I click on the start grab, it actually starts the video feed. Okay. Uh, these are your crosshairs. So you've got different ones. You got circles. I usually use just the straight crosshairs, and I'm just looking at the, the intersection of the crosshairs. That's my my point of reference. But you're going to use a box. Uh, you can also use just where they have grid lines on here, but not on here. The circle is kind of nice because it will tell you sort of the size of the beam. So right now, the first circle is about 200 microns. So your actual beam is about half that or a little less than half that. So it kind of gives you an idea of where the beam is relative to the sample that's on there. Okay. Okay, so those are just uh, the icons on the cross the top. So now I want to center this. So okay, 
Uh, the first thing you want to do, it's not going to be automatically centered when you get in. So you have a diameter key. There's three adjustments. There's the two horizontal adjustments and a vertical adjustment. The horizontal adjustments are on each side. There's only one vertical adjustment. It's only on one side. Okay. So you can see if what we usually do is place the first position is it has the vertical and a horizontal X adjustment. We call. So I can move it. You can watch your crystal. So this is typically where what you would be, your crystal. This is a giant crystal, so it, it's almost filling up the whole screen. But typically, you'd be off somewhere like that. And, and what you want to do is then bring this into the, uh, and I'll change the other direction a little bit. Okay. You want to bring this into the crosshair. So the first thing I would do is move the X adjustment, and that would bring it over here, and then I want to move the Y adjustment up, or Z I mean. Okay, so now I've got it sort of centered, and I go spin 90. So there's two big buttons, spin 180, spin 90. So if I spin 90, it'll actually do 270. Now I'm in the other direction, okay? So then I adjust this. And that's, I'm done. Okay, that's centering. But to validate that, I want to spin 180. And so as I spin this, it should almost look like the crystal's not moving. Okay? And that's the whole idea of this, right? As I move the crystal around in space, uh, the crystal should stay in the same place. And that's what you're shooting for. So I do phi zero, the first position. Once you get that centered, then I spin 90 and center that direction and then I can go back and forth 180 just to make sure that I'm processing correctly. Okay, So if you're way far out on both sides then you want to split the difference when you center. Okay? Um, and you can go by the grids, you can tell you where you're at. So this is easy, right? It's a big giant rock but when you're trying to find that 10 micron crystal in this little tiny loop, a lot of times you end up uh, centering just the loop or the mount or trying to center a spot, it's 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 more difficult, but it's it, the centering is pretty straightforward. Okay, if you notice that the if you notice you just can't center it, the microscope is probably moved, right? So it looks like the center is really here instead of there. You can still center that position, and you're still in the center. It just means that the microscope moved. Somebody bumped it or something. Okay, so it doesn't mean that if I if I center that position, I'm going to be out of the beam. It just means the microscope is off relative to where the beam is. And then Joel will align it for you. Uh, so he, he, he found that it was a little, little flaky depending on how hard, especially you close the door. So just be a little careful when you close the doors and, and we'll, we'll see. It might be just a little loose and the next time they're in there, they'll, they'll tighten it up for you. But that, so that would be centered. I'd be done, right? So it, it, I rotated it. I could do 100. I could go back 90 and then do the other direction as well, 180, just to make sure that I was staying in the beam. Okay? So how well you align this is really critical to the data you're going to get, because if your crystal is processing in and out of the beam, it obviously has a huge impact on, on the data quality, even on a good crystal. So you want to you wanna make sure that you get this aligned well before you go on especially for like phasing experiments. I mean, how you collect the data is, is really critical to whether you're successful or not. And so the better you set up everything, the better you align your crystal, the better you set the exposure time, the better the data, the easier everything else is. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, we used to say. And so the better you collect the data, the better everything else is, okay? Questions? Okay. Yeah? What about when you start moving around like Kappa so that's the idea. So the, the, the sphere confusion, it's called, or how much moving around moves away from center is very tight on a kappa. It's within 5, 10 microns. So that's the whole idea. Once I get it centered, I don't care where I move it. It's always going to stay in the same place. Even with the smaller distance? Yep. yep. So the idea is when I move that 180, if it was out of center, you'd see it process around a certain point. Right? So you, that's the, and so the kappa has a really high 
spec as far as what we call the sphere of confusion. Okay? All right. Uh, I would find a holder for your goniometer keys because you would lose like, as Joel can tell you, you lose like 30 or 40 of these. They just disappear. Um, so then you go ahead and close your closure out. And you're good to go. So you're centering your crystal, you're ready to take your first exposure. Okay? Alright, so you can go ahead and close these out. So you can keep everything open. I have a tendency to close all the applications when I'm done with them, but you don't have to. So to close it, you just go to the button up here and it closes it. Okay? The X. So the next thing is screen crystal. So that was set up. So setup's basically scribe your sample and center your crystal. There's, we have an espresso mode that's sort of beta test, if you guys ever want to use it. It's automated data collection. So you center your crystal and then it does everything else based on what resolution you're looking for. So it will index, it'll find a diffraction limit. If it matches your, it will go ahead and set up the data collection, find the, it finds the diffraction limit by going out in two theta and taking exposure time to different times to figure out what's the optimum diffraction. If I collect for 20 seconds, what's going to happen if I collect for 40? Do I actually gain anything? If I don't, then it sets a lower. And it, it calculates the strategy, starts collecting data, and then determines the space group, and then goes back and readjusts the strategy based on whether it's high or low symmetry, et cetera. So it's an automated way, but it needs some tweaking. So if, if you want to be beta testers, just let me know. Uh, but it's just a, an automated pipeline for data collection. Uh, the next thing would be screen. So I've aligned my crystal, I'm ready to take a first shot. So I go to screen and we have a simple plugin called Screen Crystal. And all this does is have your angles you can set and just an exposure that you can take. So the first thing is I've got a, and you guys can change this, I've got a button that you just hit screen and it sets the angles at 70, crystal detector distance, 2 theta 10, a little bit of an offset, and, and chi at 55. And so that's why I take my first shot at everything, is at about 70 millimeters, especially with unknowns, because I don't know what the sound constants are. So you do that, and you can come down here and just hit drive, and it will drive to those angles. So if I hit drive, or down at the bottom, I can drive and scan. So I can set my angles, and then I can come down here and set up my first image. So it's scan range, image width. The scan range is how, how much of an angular range I'm going. Scan width is how I'm slicing it, okay? So if I put the scan range at three degrees, and I put the image width at 0.5, it's gonna do six images, okay? Exposure time here, probably one second is gonna be overkill with this. So we'll just go ahead and drive and scan. So it takes about sometimes 20 seconds just to initiate the first scan. But when this turns blue, that means you're, and the shutter's open. So the light's up there, red, yellow, that means the safety shutter, the timing shutter are open. There's our first image. Actually, we've done all the images. <laughs> so it's shutterless, right? So it's just writing out as we're going. So the timing shutter open, stays open. You can see the red light shows you the safety shutter's open. And then when the blue light goes off, it's done. All right, so we just did six images. Okay? Yeah. So, and here's what the diffraction looks like. So there's our first pattern. So let's take a look at it. So what can I do? So up here is my navigation tools. So a single arrow is stepping one frame at a time, forward and backwards. So right now I'm on frame six. If I push this arrow, I go frame five, four, three, Etc. So I'm going between the frames. Double arrow line means first and last. Okay? So if I go here, I go to the first frame, there I go to the last frame. The double arrows are a movie. So here's my speed of my movie. You want to put it on slow. And it just goes through every frame one at a time. Okay? And then the button in the middle is stop. Okay? So that's how I navigate through. The up and down arrows are between runs. So if I had three runs, I could go back and forth between the runs, okay? 
The circle gives me the resolution at the edge of the circle. All right, so you pull that out and at the edge, that's what the resolution is, okay? So this is a great way to make sure the beam center is where it should be, because if I draw this all the way down, that's where the program thinks the beam center should be. It should be behind the beam center shadow. If it's not, something's wrong. Okay. Um, so that's so. If I want to know all right, what's this resolution out here, it'll tell me 1.94. Okay. You can turn the toggle these on and off by using the left mouse button. It's usually um, left mouse button is a selection, right mouse button is an action. Okay. If I want to look at the the profiles of the reflections closer, I'll do box cursor and with the left mouse button I'll draw it out and then let it up and then you can move it anywhere you want right mouse button does an action so I want to zoom in okay so now I can see the reflections okay down at the bottom there's a cross if I left mouse button I can stay zoomed in and move around the image okay this is what I like to do so I like to use take these guys and a right mouse button 3d view and that gives me a three-dimensional view of the, of the spots. So this is a great way to tell whether I've got resolution or what even in the diffraction qualities are because you can see right here I've got two spots are right next to each other, right? And it's telling me that I've got some overlap there. And so, but the profiles themselves look really nice, right? They're, they have that basic Gaussian distribution. So this is how I look to see whether I've got separation of my spots and what my profiles look like. You can tell if you've got satellites on there, you can tell if the crystals crack, but just big of the profile of the reflection itself. So I'd like to use this a lot when I'm trying to figure out what the diffraction quality of my crystal is. Uh, other things in here you can do, I can, by right mouse click, I can zoom back out. I can actually take a PNG. So if I want to send an image to my boss or just a colleague, I can just send out an image and I can do it with the diffraction I can go like this and take an image and showing what the diffraction is at this point. I can zoom in and do the same thing, right? So if I do this, left mouse button, zoom plus, I can do a circle. The circle shows me what the resolution here is as well. The other thing I could do is just down here, cursor position, anywhere I put the cursor, it'll tell me what the resolution is at that point. And if I've indexed, it'll tell me the index of that spot, roughly. The last one you have is just the line, and I don't use this much anymore, it's kind of a throwback, but you draw a line out and it shows you the signal and noise for the reflections relative to the background. And you could actually measure the distance of the reflections, although it's not very accurate. So the one I use the most is the box. What else can I do in here? Here, let's look at the rocking curves, if we have enough data here. Let's do something a little different. Okay, uh, this will be okay. All right, so I was talking about this earlier today. So let's look at, let's zoom in. So this is an omega scan. So my, omegas, my omega axis is straight up and down. So the Lorenz region is gonna be right here. So if I look at this reflection out here, I'll do a rocking curve. And a rocking curve just gives the diffraction. So I can extend out the background we just don't have enough frames yet. So that's what my profile looks like. And if I had enough background, it would give me the full width half max, which is proportional to the mosaic spread. So when you see the mosaic spread, when we index this, I'll show you, it, it, we're using the full width half max as an approximation for the mosaic spread. But if I look at one of these reflections down here, it's wider. So this reflection is almost two degrees across. So when you get into the regions that are right around the rotation angle, the reflections tend to be much wider. So just remember that if you go to look at, see what the, the, the um, sort of the mosaic spread is. Um, and that's it. In the image header, if you click the little image header record down here, and I can actually drag this up so you guys can see it. It's got all the information in the image header, so it tells you what the exposure time are, what the angles, when it was collected, what corrections are used, whether the beam center, whether the offsets. It's got all this in each header. So if you ever need to go back to a data set to see how I collected it, it all that information is there. It's in the frame header.
90. Yeah, so if you go here as phi 90, that'll swap 90 for you. You can just put in the angle. I would always go 90 degrees away because it's so often that you have anisotropic diffraction. And it, it really is, I had one where it looked like this, only much better. In one direction, you rotate it, it's like it wasn't even the same crystal. It's just amazing sometimes that the, the diffraction is that anisotropic disorder is such that it's in a direction, it's directional. Questions? So to get back to the original zoom, I just right mouse click, zoom minus. So it's left is select, right is do a function. And you just close this out. Now, yeah, it diffracts good enough. I'm going to try to index it. Okay. Well, we set up some runs already for indexing. Those two runs I was talking about. So I can go to collect data, and I certainly don't need to do 10 seconds, but 70 is fine. So that's where I usually start with anything, especially unknown. So what I can do is I've got these two runs I set up, but I'll just change the exposure time because I don't need 10 seconds. And I just hit finish. So now it's going to go out. It's going to run two, three, uh, three uh, degree scans. It's going to do phi 0, phi 90. It's going to do six frames because I'm doing half degree rotations at phi 0 and then six at phi 90. So now the blue light's on. The safety shutter's open. I can tell by the red light, so I'm collecting data. So I just finished the first six. Now I'm going to rotate 90. I'm going to do the second six. So after I get that done, then it's going to try to harvest spots. It's going to try to index. It's going to refine the reduced triclinic self if it finds one. It's going to do a high, higher Brave search. It's going to do a final refinement and come hopefully back with the right cell. OK, so we're done with the data collection. Now it's going to harvest spots. It's found 514 spots. It's indexed. And you can tell because it switches between what you harvest to what you're predicting. And, the, and, and it's found an orthorhombic cell, 183043. So the thing to look at here is do the, the predicted positions match the diffracted pattern? And that's what it's all about. Right? And you can do this by, you can go, you can do a movie if you draw this down. And, and, and if I'm unsure about a space group, sometimes I'll do this where I'll display a movie and watch how the overlays match the spots as you move. Because if the space group is wrong, they'll start to move away um, from it. Okay, so that's, that's how you would do it automatically. Manually, we would do the same thing, just doing the steps one by one. Right, so let's delete those. So in here, it's got my unit cell. It's got my number of reflections. It gives me a mosaic spread. And again, that's an approximate value. Uh, it's more of a relative. It's not a true mosaic spread. It's just looking at the full width half max of the rocking curves. Um, so I could delete these and start from scratch. So if I go to harvest, now it says I've got my matrix frames. I've got two runs, six frames. Here is I'm smoothing images. Now, if you, I don't know if you guys can see this, maybe I can zoom in a little bit, it makes it a little easier to see. If I turn this off, I get a lot more reflections. It's a little hard to tell in this one because the reflections are so strong to begin with. Uh, but if I go down here, if I move the slider bar, then you get a lot more reflections in if you move the this back up. So this is just more spots, less spots if you're used to Denso. So all you're doing is, is changing the signal noise I'm accepting for getting a reflection. Um, for instance, if I go here and add, um, I only want data to four angstroms. If I do this, a lot of the green spots go away. The green circles are what I'm using to tell me that's I'm harvesting that spot, right? So now I'm only harvesting data to four angstroms. So if I can just highlight that, delete it, and now I'm back to all the way again, right? And so you could do this either way. You could do it on the low end. Say I was getting some beams, uh, some scatter around the beam stop shadow. I could say add and go from 15, or say 14 angstroms, and now it will cut out anything at low angle. Um, 
save only reflections of span images. That, that's what I talked about earlier, where it, if a, a reflection has to be spread over more than one image to be saved, and that just helps eliminate some noise. In this case, it's not going to matter because everything's so strong. Uh, okay, so then I would go next step. So the arrows go next step, previous step. The next step would be indexing. Oh, I don't, uh, yep, I'm going to harvest and then index. Okay, so now I've got 514, right? And now I'm in the indexing window. So now I can change the same things if I want to. I've got difference vector in fast Fourier. I'm going to say everything's okay. I'm going to now go to the next step, which would be actually indexing. This gives me my difference vector and my fast Fourier results. So they're, obviously they're both very good. But you can select either one. They're giving you the same cell essentially, but you can select either one you want. Okay. And then the next step then would be refinement. So now I want to refine. I've got my reduced triclinic cell. I want to refine the cell constants so they improve. So now it says, okay, I'm going to let you start with 168 reflections. Okay, so I hit the refine button, and now it updates my, my chi-squares or my, my offsets for the positions. So that's pretty good, 0.1 and 0.2, that's fine. So okay, now how about if I add more reflections? Now I've got 500, and I, and I refine this looking at how those are varying. And if I go to histograms, I can say, okay, things are shifted a little bit, and that's probably because of those dual peaks because I've got those two spots in there for, that are overlapping like that. So I could do things I could do for, to try to, to adjust that. Let's see if we can harvest it and get something better. So I could set this really high. Let's go with 40. Uh, let's see what this does. So I've got a lot better RMS value, so I'm, I'm, I'm probably picking up some of the secondary, the secondary reflections. What is that, the, the second reflection that's on those? That's something to do with the, the, the structure, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, now if I look at the histogram, the histogram is better. Not quite, so it's, it's I'm getting some overlap as I rotate it, but that's fine. Um, and then you can say, okay, what happens if I take out this guy? So I go here and I delete. I say, okay, refine. And it, it got actually a little better. So that's, and that's probably fine with the, the crystal design there. The next one would be looking for higher symmetry. So now I've got my, my updated cell constants. Now I can go look for a higher symmetry search. And it picks up the orthorhombic because it, that matches the Lowy constraints the best. Okay, so it always selects the highest symmetry that match the constraints. And the figure merits around 0.6, so that's typical. So it's 0 to 1. Right? So it's opposite. If you're used to Denso, it's always the lowest number is better, where here's the highest. We have to be different. We can't be the same. So um, the next thing then would be now A, B, and C can, can move, but alpha, beta, and gamma have to equal 90. And so the program locks that in. So then you just refine, and you're done. So that would be indexing manually. So it's walking through the steps, you harvest, you, you play around the harvest frames, and then you uh, index, reduce triclinic cell, you uh, ref um, refine that to get better cell constants, do a higher symmetry search, and then finish with a refinement. And that's what the auto mode does, okay? Questions? So if you've collected data, this is all the same stuff you've heard before in every other program. It's just differently formatted for us. And there's different, little different tools and everything. This is what our lat looks like. If I were to, to look at these reflections in reciprocal space, there is my two scans separated by 90 degrees. And you can see the curvature of diffraction space, right? So you've all seen eball sphere. You see the construction of those on the web. So that's how you collect data. It's in a curved space. So if you look at here, you can see the curvature of the diffraction space. So when we talk about the fast Fourier, so 
you can't really see any pattern. It's a little hard with this few reflections, but you start rotating, and there, if I rotate this around, on the sides are a, Fourier, a one dimensional Fourier transform. There's one of your unicell vectors, and you can see how there, it ends up with a periodic pattern that creates almost a delta function. That's what the indexing is looking for. So when you, see, you hear about the fast 4A, this is exactly what it's doing uh, when it's trying to find the unit cell. And so there's not, I don't know if we have enough data, but you can try to get the other one as well. And you see it at the very top. I'm just off a little bit. Oh, that's close. It helps if you have more data, and I can, I'll show you an example tomorrow. But this is, this is the program I, I use for, for modifying my reflection rate. So say I wanted to, to get rid of some stuff in here that I didn't like. I could do a box cursor. I could just say delete, and it would get rid of those reflections. This is the one that's the most useful. So you, you draw out a lattice line. And so I know this is my lattice, but say I had all kinds of stuff in between that was screwing up my indexing. With a plus key, I could just add one at a time. Eventually, I lock in. And I can say, OK, I can change the color. So I can say, make those yellow. And now I can get rid of red. So I get rid of everything that isn't on the lattice plane. So anything that's in between that's screwing up my indexing is gone. And then I can go out and just index off this, these reflections. So this is a really great tool. So when I can't index something, all I do is come in here and it tells me almost immediately why I can't index it. Usually it's because I've got a bunch of noise. Or it's just you look in one direction and all the spots are running together. You just can't get that, that direction. A lot of times you'll see two short axes and one long axis, and you just have to be careful of that. That's it. So then I could come back into, and then now the reflection ray is split. So I have both yellow and red reflections. Um, so now I want to set up a data collection. How do I do that? So then I would go to collect. So that's the next logical step, right? And so I would go collect strategy. So this is going to read in my information, my unit cell, my point group. So now it comes up with chiral 222. Remember I was talking about that earlier today, where it's always going to select the lowest symmetry possible for this point group. So for orthorhombic, chiral 222 is the same as 222. That's the lowest point group, right? That's going to keep I plus and I minus separate and determine them as separate reflections. Now, I could come here and say, OK, select MML. So now I'm saying that the data is centrosymmetric. And now I plus and I minus are identical. So that's going to be a faster data set. OK? All right. So say I do, OK. Uh, I'll just go 1.5. So it tries to give me the distance it thinks it wants to be, but we've got some issues with these small reflections, so maybe we'll try to pull it back to see if we can get some separation. So let's go back to 70 millimeters and see what happens. Everything else is pretty much the same. Now here's the difference I was talking about today about the multiplicity. So here it's Maximum, uh, minimum multiplicity 90% rule. That means across resolution, I want the same multiplicity up to 90% identical. Okay, so I say okay. And the program goes out now. Now it's trying to determine the strategy. It takes uh, a few seconds. So now it's come back and said, okay, I put a multiplicity of one, but I've got 100% completeness, but I've got 5.6 average multiplicity. And that's just because of the nature of the experiment, trying to get that complete. Now let's see if we go to, we uh, go back to strategy and uncheck that. Let's see if it's any, any faster. OK, now I've got a complete data set. And it's only 3.4% per, uh, percent, or 3.4 multiplicity. But the multiplicity is a little less the same as you're going across resolution. So that's the difference between those two. So if you're just going for a quick data set, just uncheck that and do a strategy based on completeness. 
But if you really want true multiplicity across the resolution range, then I would use the 90% rule. Okay? Why do you check the mosaic? Hmm? Why do you check the mosaic? So the mosaicity is a little hard to determine at this point. So we don't take that much into effect during the, the uh, strategy calculation. Because if you index off of 3 degrees, 6 degrees total, you're not going to get a very accurate measurement of what the mosaic spread is. And that can vary as you, depending on where you're at orientation-wise. So for the data collection, it really doesn't matter much what the multiplicity is, but it does with the separation spot separation and so that's sort of a little bit up to you the program tries to suggest based on what you harvested what the true uh, dx should be but again that's dependent upon how what you harvest and how close the spots are with you so if i'm at if i've got a 300 angstrom cell and i'm trying to do this in 70 millimeters the programs are going to have no idea because the spots are all going to be running together so it's a little bit up to you to determine what the correct distance should be. Okay. Um, and you can actually look at this in reciprocal space, so it shows you what you've collected, um, what the average multiplicity of the reflections as you get to low angle, the multiplicity is higher than it is at high angle, uh, and, uh, and as well as uh, along the, the axle, the rotation or the uh, unit cell vectors. So you can kind of play around with that and, and kind of get an idea. It's a, it's a good teaching tool, but it just gives you where the multiplicity is and where your reflections are. So um, select scan parameters. This is where you put in the rotation and the exposure time you want. So say I went to 0.5 degrees and I did one second. Now it tells me that I'm going to have a two second per degree exposure time, and the total time is going to be six minutes for a data set. So this will tell you, when you set the time and exposure width that you want, will tell you how long your data set's going to go. And if you go say OK, this tells you we've got 100% completeness, and it's essentially rounding out to seven minutes. And it tells you 10% of the uh, data have multiplicity greater than five, 90% um, of the data has multiplicity greater than 2, so it's kind of giving you the breakdown. If I go to edit, I can look, it tells me exactly what the run is I'm doing. Say I wanted to decrease the sweep width, sweep width, I just click on it, I go to 180, I say apply, then it updates, and now I'm just a little bit not complete and my multiplicity is dropped. Okay. So you can actually play around with your own scans and the program will tell you how good you did. Okay? So that's it. So I, then I'm, I'm done. I would just close here. I would go to run experiment. I hit a pen strategy and it re automatically reads the run in. Then all I do is say, okay, I'm good. I'll execute. And so the program knows what the angles are, it knows where to go, and it just goes to the first position of the first scan and starts. And then if you have multiple scans, when the first scan would finish, it would automatically switch to the first position of the second scan, start the data collection. And now we have the frames coming on. So that's kind of where we were going to do the work we were going to do in here. If you wanted to, you could actually set this to re to actually integrate on the fly. I could go in here and say import the runs from this and just say start. And it would actually wait for the data to catch up and it would start integrating the data. So now it's doing some refi early refinement trying to optimize the box size. Now you'll see the box size really get big. And now that's what you want to see is you want to see the spot inside the box. So it's automatically updating the size of the spots and the box that you're integrating on. And then it's just waiting for the next frame to come on. What if, we, if, we, if we're supposed to screen the crystals in the proteome server, right? The, 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 yeah. Right. So say again? We are screening the crystal in another in a, in a, in a program and we are collecting it in another program. So, um, so you would screen here because you're using a system. If you want to use another program to 
reduce the data, for instance. You could convert the frames for XDS, for instance, convert to CBF works really well. So you could actually, and you can do that automatically. So there's a flag that you can set that CBF frames are always written. Yeah, so uh, if you guys are XDS fans and you want to use XDS, it's, it's pretty easy to use. And Kai has made a, a script for us. He's included Photon 2 support in the Generate XDS. So if you go to the wiki for XDS, you download the Generate underscore XDS. I've got a, a PDF I'll send you. It's really easy to run and generate the uh, uh, IMP file, and then that processes the data. Um, and then the other programs, uh, HKL would do it automatically. So it reads our frame format directly. There's just the cost issue that's associated. $59,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rather expensive to have uh, HKL. Um, and he's, it's detector specific, so even groups that have a license already, if they get a new instrument, they have to buy a new license for the new detector. Um, and MOSFILM, I've just, I'm not, it's just not supported anymore, so it's, I think it's going to basically fade away. Uh, there's just, Andrew Leslie, I guess, is still working on it, uh, but I just haven't heard much about it. And with dials... It can CBF files too. It can, but it's really not very good at it. <laughs> So I've had problems reading CBF, standard CBF format in MOSFILM, because they do some strange things with orientation when you read files in, because he repositions the origin of the frames, and I've never got it to work. I've tried, um, and there's no one to go to. We were trying to hire Harry Powell for a while to, to have full support, but it just, it just didn't work out. So uh, a lot of people still like to use it, but it's just, just no support for it anymore. And so, so if you collect the data here, we're supposed to you can, but you don't have to. Like I said, if you have XDS, you can take the data and go and, and, and just get your CBF files and go and process it anywhere you want. Um, I know that Global Phasing has put XDS, so they actually pull our data through their pipeline. Um, and like I said, HKL works. You just have to have a license for it. He, he, re he reads the frames directly, so you don't have to do any conversion. It's just like you would normally run HKL. It's just that you charge uh, quite a bit for a license. Uh, but if you've got an arrangement with him, your lab has an arrangement with him, you might be able to work out some deal with him. He doesn't need anything. All he needs is he does his own calibrations. Vladek does his own thing, his own way. So you send him a license design data set, he gives you the site file, and you're good to go. So. But yeah, and dials, I don't know. That That's a new, newer. Uh, consortium in the UK that's doing an integration platform and that would probably work because they probably support CBF format directly so I think you could probably use that you could do it that. I haven't had much experience with it but you could probably use that as well yeah, so um, most things are we, we tried to go to CBF because that was the most universally um, supported foreign format I would love to have a universal format just couldn't get any of the vendors to agree to it so CBF is the closest thing to it. So yeah, try and you might be able to get MOSFILM to work. I just had troubles with it. And I was using Windows version. I think the Linux version is a little less buggy. Uh, so it might be possible you could get to work with the Linux version. Whoever well, has CCP4, MOSFILM is coming with the CCP4, right? So it's, yeah. it's an easy idea. Yeah. But it's, they're not supporting it anymore because uh, cause of dials. Uh, and from my understanding is they're kind of dropping MOSFET. So, um, other questions? I'm sure you'll have lots when you actually start to use it. So when you run into things or have questions or not sure about, something's not working with a data set, let me know and we'll, we'll work through. We're pretty good about, we, we do all the software development in-house. So if you have suggestions or things we find bugs we have, Kind of quarterly releases. We're a little slower these days, but we release bug fixes and things like that. All the software is free, so you just go to our website and you download the updates. So, okay. <laughs>